Chapter 30 Lawrence flees from London and Faisal becomes king in Baghdad. After the peace conference and after Amir Faisal had returned to Damascus, Lawrence vanished. Many of his friends thought that he had returned to Arabia to resume the role of mystery man. But I doubted this, for when I had last talked to him in Paris, I had asked him point blank if he intended to go back to the East in order to help the Arabs build up their new state. His answer was most emphatically in the negative. I am not going to return for some years, perhaps never, he said. It would not be for the good of the Arabs for me to be there. As a matter of fact, I haven't the remotest idea of what I will do. The war has so completely upset my life that it may take me several years to find myself. In the meantime, I hope to discover a secluded corner somewhere in England, far from war, politics, and diplomacy, where I can read a bit of Greek without being interrupted. His attitude regarding return to the Near East seemed to me another indication of his far-sightedness. During their war of liberation, the Arabs had followed Lawrence partly because of his own personality, but mainly because he offered them a substitute for Turkish oppression. He well knew that as soon as the excitement of war disappeared, his power over them would diminish. What would have happened if he had returned to the Near East? What would have been the outcome if he had temporarily gained a position of political authority, equivalent to the military position he had attained in Arabia? It is conceivable that, because of his tremendous influence over the Arabs during the war, he might at the outset have had a large following. But in a few months, someone would have raised the cry, Away with the infidel! If he had returned to Damascus simply in the capacity of advisor to Faisal, that alone might have undermined the emir's hold over his people. The Arabs are jealous, fickle, and suspicious, and they would have accused Faisal of being a mere puppet. If Lawrence had craved power, he might conceivably have made himself an Arabian dictator by turning Muslim but nothing could have been more remote from his mind. He had not led the Arabs to gratify personal ambition. His sole motive was to defeat the Germans and Turks, and at the same time to help his friends the Arabs win their freedom. While the peace conference was still in session, many people said to me that young Lawrence was the person best equipped to represent Great Britain in the Near East, and that he no doubt would return to Syria and Arabia in an official capacity. But Lawrence's one ambition was to take off his uniform, drop out of political and military life, and return to his archaeological studies. I asked Nuri Pasha, one of the generals on Amir Faisal's staff in Paris, how the Arabs intended to repay Colonel Lawrence for his great service to their country. He replied, We have offered him everything we have, but he refuses to accept anything. But if he will consent, we wish to give him the exclusive archaeological rights to all the buried cities of Arabia and Syria. Lawrence had other plans, however. For months after the peace conference, not even his most intimate friends knew what had become of him. Meanwhile, I had returned to America and started a tour of the continent presenting the pictorial records of the Allied campaigns which Mr. Chase and I had prepared but we were unexpectedly invited to appear for a season at Covent Garden Royal Opera House, London, a thing we had never dreamed might occur, because our material had been obtained solely for America. Naturally, one of the first things I endeavored to do upon arrival in England was to find Colonel Lawrence. I wanted to show him what Auda, Abu Tayyi, and the rest of his Arabian nights looked like on the screen. Both at the War Office and the Foreign Office, no one seemed to know what had become of him. He had apparently vanished into the blue, just as he used to do in the desert. But a fortnight later I received a note from him. All it said was, My dear Lowell Thomas, I saw your show last night, and thank God the lights were out. T. E. Lawrence I discovered that this man, whom all London would have been delighted to honor, was living incognito in a modest furnished room in a side street over the Dover tube station. Not even his landlady had any suspicion of his identity, but he could not long keep it a secret. A few days later he came around and had tea with us. When he discovered that I was married and that my wife was with me, he seemed very much embarrassed and blushed all over. He implored me to return to America and to stop telling the public about his exploits, 
He said that if I stayed in London any longer, life would not be worth living for him, because as a result of my production at Covent Garden, he was being hounded night and day by autograph fiends, reporters, magazine editors, book publishers, and representatives of the gentler sex whom he feared more than a Turkish army corps. He said that as a result of the two weeks I had been speaking in London, he had received some twenty-eight proposals of marriage, and were arriving on every mail, most of them via Oxford. When he came to call, I noticed he had two books under his arm. One was a volume of Persian poems, and the other, judging by its title, was about the last book in the world that you would have been expecting this young man to be reading. This man who had been called the uncrowned king of the Arabs, who had achieved what no sultan and no caliph had been able to do in more than five hundred years, who had refused some of the highest honors of the disposition of the greatest governments of the world, who had been made an honorary descendant of the Prophet, and who will live in history as one of the most romantic and picturesque figures of all time. It was the diary of a disappointed man. But when Lawrence found out that there was little immediate prospect of my sailing for America, and when he discovered that he was being followed by an Italian countess who wore a wristwatch on her ankle, he fled from London. It was not long after this that Amir Faisal lost his throne in Syria, and there was a good deal of propaganda work being done by the French in order to encourage the British not to sponsor the Arab cause. So, despite the fact that he had gone into retirement and was trying to keep out of political affairs, Lawrence could not refrain from defending Faisal. Without appearing personally, he began writing articles in London papers presenting the Arab side of the controversy. I will quote from one or two of them, because they give one an idea of the versatility of this youth, who could wield a pen as ably as he could lead an army. There is a feeling in England that the French occupation of Damascus and their expulsion of Faisal from the throne to which the grateful Syrians had elected him is... After all, a poor return for Faisal's gifts to us during the war, and the idea of falling short of an Oriental friend in generosity leaves an unpleasantness in our mouths. Faisal's courage and statesmanship made the Mecca revolt spread beyond the holy cities until it became a very active help to the Allies in Palestine. The Arab army, created in the field, grew from a mob of Bedouins into an organized and well-equipped body of troops. They captured 35,000 Turks, disabled as many more, took 150 guns, and 100,000 square miles of Ottoman territory. This was great service in our extreme need, and we felt we owed the Arabs a reward. And to Faisal, their leader, we owed double, for the loyal way in which he had arranged the main Arab activity when and where Allenby directed. Yet we have really no competence in this matter to criticize the French. They have only followed in very humble fashion in their sphere of Syria the example we set them in Mesopotamia. England controls nine parts out of ten in the Arab world, and inevitably calls the tune to which the French must dance. If we follow an Arab policy, they must be Arab. If we fight the Arabs, they must fight the Arabs. It would show a lack of humor if we approved them for a battle near Damascus, and the blotting out of the Syrian essay and self-government while we were fighting battles near Baghdad and trying to render the Mesopotamians incapable of self-government by smashing every head that raised itself among them. Britain was having a turbulent time in Mesopotamia just when the French had ousted Faisal from Syria. Lawrence felt that there ought to be a way of putting Faisal's talents to some use in Baghdad, and this article was his diplomatic way of introducing the plan which afterward was developed and adopted. A few weeks ago, the chief of our administration in Baghdad was asked to receive some Arab notables who wanted to urge their case for partial autonomy. He packed the delegation with some nominees of his own, and in replying, told them that it would be long before they were fit for responsibility. Brave words, but the burden of them has been heavy on the Manchester men this week at Hilla. These risings take a regular course. There is a preliminary Arab success, then British reinforcements go out as a punitive force. They fight their way. Our losses are slight, the Arab losses heavy, to their objective, which is meanwhile bombarded by artillery aeroplanes or gunboats. Finally, perhaps, a village is burned and the district pacified. It is odd that we do not use poison gas on these occasions. Bombing the houses is a patchy way of getting the women and children, and our infantry always incur losses in shooting down the Arab men. By gas attacks, the whole population of offending districts could be wiped out neatly.
and as a method of government it would be no more immoral than the present system. We realize the burden the army in Mesopotamia is to the imperial exchequer, but we do not see as clearly the burden it is to Mesopotamia. It has to be fed, and all its animals have to be fed. The fighting forces are now 83,000 strong, but the ration strength is 300,000. There are three laborers to every soldier to supply and serve him. One in ten of the souls in Mesopotamia today belongs to our army. The greenness of the country is being eaten up by them, and the process is not yet at its height. To be sure, they demand that we double our existing garrison. As local resources are exhausted, this increase of troops will increase the cost by more than arithmetical progression. These troops are just for police work, to hold down the subjects of whom the House of Lords was told two weeks ago that they were longing for our continued presence in their country. No one can imagine what will be our state there if one of Mesopotamia's three envious neighbors, all nursing plans against us, attacks us from outside while there is still disloyalty within. Our communications are very bad. Our defense positions all have both flanks in the air, and there seem to have been two incidents lately. We do not trust our troops as we did during the war. Then there are the military works. Great barracks and camps have had to be constructed on hundreds of miles of military roads. Great bridges to carry motor lorries exist in remote places, where the only local transport is by pack. The bridges are made of temporary materials, and their upkeep is enormous. They are useless to the civil government, which yet has to take them over at a high valuation, and so the new state will begin its career with an enforced debt. English statesmen, from the premier downwards, weep tears over the burden thrust on us in Mesopotamia. If only we could raise a local army, said Lord Curzon. But they will not serve, except against us, his lordship no doubt added to himself. If only we could find Arabs qualified to fill executive posts. In this dearth of local talent, the parallel of Syria is illuminating. Faisal had no difficulty in raising troops, though he had great difficulty in paying them. However, the conditions were not the same, for he was arbitrarily deprived of his customs revenue. Faisal had no difficulty in setting up an administration in which the five leading spirits were all natives of Baghdad. It was not a very good administration, but in the East the people are less exigent than we are. Even in Athens, Solon gave them not the best laws, but the best they would accept. The British in Mesopotamia cannot find one competent person, but I maintain that the history of the last few months is shown their political bankruptcy, and their opinion should not weigh with us at all. I know ten British officials with tried and honorable reputations of the Sudan, Sinai, Arabia, Palestine, each and all of whom could set up an Arab government comparable to Faisal's in Baghdad next month. It also would not be a perfect government, but it would be better than Faisal's, for he, poor man, to pull him down, was forbidden foreign advisers. The Mesopotamian effort would have the pay or have the British government behind it, and it would be child's pay for a decent man to run, so long as he ran it like Cromer's Egypt, not like the Egypt of the Protectorate. Cromer dominated Egypt, not because England gave him force or because Egypt loved us, or for any outside reason, but because he was so good a man. England has stacks of first class men. The last thing you need out there is a genius. What is required is a tearing up of what we have done, and beginning again on advisory lines. It is no good patching with the present system. Concessions to local feelings, and such like rubbish, are only weakness concessions, incentives to more violence. We are big enough to admit a fault, and turn a new page, and we ought to do it with a hoot of joy, because it will save us a million pounds a week. When in Arabia, I would occasionally draw Lawrence in a conversation about the statesmen and leaders of the day. He invariably had something amusing to tell about each. It was from him that I first learned that Mr. Lloyd George employed a barber to visit No. 10 Downing Street daily to dress his famous head of hair. On another occasion, I asked him to tell me something about Lord Curzon. He replied, In order to give you an idea what Lord Curzon is like, I must explain to you his outlook on life. Lord Curzon divides all the inhabitants of the earth into two groups, the masses and the classes. The classes are Lord Curzon and the king, Everybody else belongs to the masses. So while we were still at Covent Garden Operation House, when I heard a story about Lawrence and his first meeting with the aloof and pompous Marquis, I recalled what the colonel had said to me about his lordship in Arabia. 
Lauren's name was on everyone's lips at that time, and the anecdote is a good one, whether true or not. I will recount it as told to me. Lord Curzon said to one of his satraps at the foreign office, I say, who is this person, Lawrence? See that he is brought into our presence. Eventually, another member of the cabinet unearthed the hero of Arabia and lured him to the foreign office. When ushered before the Great One, the latter waved his meek-looking and diminutive visitor into a chair and proceeded to deliver lecture on the Near East to this young man who was an authority on the subject. Lawrence stood it as long as he could, and finally, unable to restrain himself any longer, he said to the noble Marquis, But, my dear man, you don't know what you're talking about. Even while fighting in the desert, Lawrence had foreseen the complications that were going to arise after the war was over, and as noted before, in his advance on Damascus, he was extremely anxious that Amir Faisal's men should enter the city ahead of the British and the French, because he realized this would make it doubly difficult for the Allies to disregard their friends, the Arabs, when the tumult and shouting was over. Lord Winterton, who was with the Arab forces during the fighting around Damascus, in an article in Blackwood's magazine, pays an eloquent tribute to Lawrence, and tells us how he was always thinking far in advance of the problem of the moment. I am of the opinion, writes the Earl, that we owed much in those few days before we finally effected a junction with the British to the good generalship displayed by General Nuri, backed by L's advice and genius for thinking ahead of nine people out of ten. Then in another place, Lord Winterton adds, he had no intention that the Arabs should take a back seat in the final destruction of the Turkish army. There were political as well as military considerations at stake, as the Arabs knew well, and El was only playing on a highly keyed-up instrument. El infected us all with his enthusiasm, and I began to feel, despite my temperamental dislike of adventure qua adventure, that it would be monstrous if, when the Turkish fox came to be broken up, the British got the body, head, and brush, and the Arabs, who had helped to hunt him for three and a half years, only got a bit of the pad. If we were in at the military death of Turkey, Br'er Fox, it would make it more difficult to refuse the Arabs a big share of the results, spoils, if you will, of the victory. During his seven years wandering through the desert, dressing like an Arab, living with Arabs in their tents, observing their customs, talking to them in their own dialects, riding on his camel across a broad expanse of lonely country, unbroken except by the long purple line of the horizon, lying down at night under a silent dome of stars, Thomas Edward Lawrence drank the cup of Arabian wisdom and absorbed the spirit of the nomad peoples. No Westerner ever acquired greater influence over an Oriental people. He had united the scattered tribes of Arabia, and induced chieftains who had been bitter enemies for generations to forget their feuds and fight side by side for the same cause. From remote parts of Arabia swore these sons of the desert had swarmed with standards, as if he had been a new prophet. Largely by reason of his genius, Faisal and his followers had freed Arabia from Turkish oppression. Lawrence had contributed new life and soul to the movement for Arabian independence, the far-reaching results of his spectacular and successful campaign were destined to play an important part in the final adjustment of Near Eastern affairs, and halfway measures made no more appeal to Colonel Lawrence in time of peace than in time of war. In another of his communications to the press, when he was trying to mold public opinion in favor of the Arabs, we catch a further glimpse of his views. The Arabs rebelled against the Turks, said Lawrence in a letter of the Times, not because the Turk government was notably bad, but because they wanted independence. They did not risk their lives in battle to change masters, to become British subjects or French citizens, but to win a show of their own. Whether they are fit for independence or not remains to be tried. Merit is no qualification for freedom. Bulgars, Afghans, and Tahitians have it. Freedom is enjoyed when you are so well armed, or so turbulent, or inhabit a country so thorny that the expense of your neighbors occupying you is greater than the profit. But Colonel Lawrence has no illusions as to the capacity of the Arabs for organization and administration. He fully appreciates that these are not their strong points, but he has faith in them and believes they have a message to give the West. History is against the probability of the creation of an Arabic empire, he once said to me in Arabia. The Semitic mind does not lean towards system or organization. It is practically impossible to fuse the diverse elements among the Semites into a modern, closely-linked state. 
On the other hand, the Semites have been more fertile in ideas than any other people. The Arabian movement has presented itself to me as the latest expression of the influence of the desert upon the settled peoples. The Semitic uh, spirit has again exercised its influence over the Mediterranean basin. Amir Faisal is the last of the line of Semitic prophets. His campaign for Arabian independence, which made some five million converts among the Arabic-speaking peoples of the Near East, is by no means the least of those revelations by which the Semites so profoundly affected the world. The Semites are represented by very little art, architecture, philosophy. There have been few Jewish artists or philosophers, but we find an amazing fertility among the Semites in the creation of creeds and religions. Three of these creeds, Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism, have become great world movements. The broken fragments of countless other religions which have failed or found a day on the fringes of the desert. The desert seems to produce only one idea, the universality of God. We who have gone out to discover the meaning of the desert have found only emptiness, nothing but sand, wind, soil, and empty space. The Bedouins leave behind them every extraneous comfort and go to live in the desert in the very arms of starvation that they may be free. The desert exacts a price for its secret. It makes the Bedouins entirely useless to their fellow men. There has never been a Bedouin prophet. On the other hand, there has never been a Semitic prophet who has not, before preaching his message, gone into the desert and caught from the desert dwellers a reflection of their belief. The idea of the absolute worthlessness of the present world is a pure desert conception at the root of every Semitic religion, which must be filtered through the screen of a non-nomad prophet before it can be accepted by settled peoples. With his exuberant imagination and his vista down the centuries, it was an easy matter for Lawrence to throw himself heart and soul into the Arabian movement. He remembered the time when the Arab Empire controlled most of the Mediterranean world, when its philosophers, poets, and scientists enriched the culture of Europe. There are some people who have dreams at night and wake to find them all rot. There are others who have dreams in the daytime and occasionally they come true, he said to me one day in London. It is Lauren's conviction that the Arabs still have something to give the world, something that the world, particularly the materialistic Western world, sorely needs. It has been a fortunate thing for the Arabs that he had the genius to make his dreams come true. I should like to use Lawrence's own words in defining just what the Arabian movement means. There is no reason to expect from the Arabian movement, Lawrence told me, any new development of law or economics. But Faisal has succeeded in restating forcibly the vital doctrine of the Semites. Otherworldliness and his ideals will have a profound effect on the growing nationalist movements in Syria, Mesopotamia, Arabia, and Palestine, which are the present homes of Semitic political life. It is like watching the waves of the Atlantic coming in and breaking themselves against the cliffs of the west coast of Ireland. To look at them, you would say the cliffs were made of iron and the waves quite futile. But when you study a map, you see that the whole coast is torn open by the wearing of the sea, and you realize that it is only a matter of time before there will cease to be an Irish question. In the same way, the successive Semitic protests against the material world may seem simply so much waste effort. But some day the Semitic conviction of the other world may roll unchecked over the place where this world has been. I rank Faisal's movements as one of the most protest against the utter uselessness of material things. I was only trying to help roll up the wave which came to its crest and toppled over when we took Damascus. It was just rolling up the Arabs in a tremendous effort and joining the whole nation together in pursuit of an ideal object that had no practical shape or value. We were expressing our entire contempt for the material pursuits exalted by others, from money-making to marking statues. Lawrence expresses the conviction that the Arabian movement is nothing more than a protest against outside interference. This time the protest had been directed against Turkey, but the next time it may be launched against France, Italy, Britain, or any Western nation that develops a tendency to be disregardful of another people's deep-seated racial sentiments. When you can understand the point of view of another race, you are a civilized being, once remarked Lawrence to me in the desert. 
I think that England, out of sheer conceit, and not because of any inherent virtue in my countrymen, has been less guilty in its contacts than other nations. We do not wish other people to be like us, or to conform to our customs, because we regard imitation of ourselves as blasphemous. Later on in Paris, Lawrence summed up for me the whole Near Eastern situation in a few words. He is of the opinion that France, in receiving the mandatory for Syria, is merely obtaining control of a temporary phase of the Arabian movement. The Hejaz will be absorbed in a few years by an Arabian state to the north of it. Damascus has always been the center of Arabian self-determination, but Syria is a small country and too poor to look forward to a great agricultural or industrial future. It acts merely as a front door to Kurdistan, Armenia, and Mesopotamia. When Western enterprise restores Assyria and Babylonia to their former level of agricultural prosperity, and when advantage has been taken of the mineral wealth of Armenia and the cheap fuel of Mesopotamia, then the Arabian center will inevitably be transferred from Damascus eastward to Mosul, Baghdad, some new capital. Mesopotamia has three times the irrigable area of Egypt. Egypt now has a population of more than 13 million, while there are only 5 million in Mesopotamia. In the near future, Mesopotamia will increase to 40 million, and Syria, which now has a population of 3,500,000, will have perhaps 5 million. This is rather a bad outlook for Syria. But no matter where the center of Arabian gravity may shift, nothing can change the Arabian desert and the ideals of its people. And despite Lauren's desire to live in retirement, with only his books for his companions, his countrymen would not listen to it. When Winston Churchill took up the cabinet post of colonial secretary, one of the first things he did was to force Lawrence to come and help the government straighten out the Near East Tangle. He appointed Lawrence advisor on Near Eastern affairs, and the latter reluctantly agreed to remain at the colonial office for just one year. During this time, the Mesopotamian problem was solved along the lines that Lawrence had originally suggested, and Amir Faisal was called to Baghdad and made king of Iraq the modern successor to the great Caliph Harun al-Rashid of Arabian Nights fame. Thus Faisal, despite the fact that he had lost the throne of Syria, became the founder of a new Mesopotamian dynasty and the ruler of a far more important state. Chapter 31 The Secret of Lauren's Success among the hundreds of questions that I've been asked about Colonel Lawrence by press and public in every part of the world, some of the most frequent have been, what was the secret of Lawrence's success, and how could a Christian and a European gain such influence over fanatical Mohammedans? What reward has Lawrence received? Is he going to write a book? Where is he now? How does he earn his living? And what is going to become of him? What are his hobbies? Will he ever marry? Is he a normal human being, and has he a sense of humor? Of course, there have been a host of factors that have contributed to his success, that gained him his influence and that enabled him to win not only the respect of the Arabs, but their admiration and their devotion as well. They respected him partly because, although a mere youth, he seemed to have more wisdom than their wise men. They admired him partly because of his personal prowess, his ability to outdo them at the things in which they excel, such as camel riding and shooting, and also because of his courage and modesty. He usually led them in battle, and under fire he was courageous to a fault. Wounded a number of times, his injuries, fortunately, were never serious enough to keep him out of action. Often he was too far from a base to get medical attention so that his wounds were obliged to heal themselves. The Arabs became devoted to him because he gained them victories and then tactfully gave all the credit to his companions. And that he was a Christian they considered unfortunate and they decided that it was an accident, and in some mysterious way, the will of Allah, but some of them regarded him as one sent from heaven by their prophet to help free them from the Turks. West and East fraternize politely, if rather inharmoniously, in the more accessible towns of Arabia and Syria, for the West has money to spend and the East is avaricious, but away in the desert and wild places it is otherwise. The nomads, whose ancestors have roamed the country for four thousand years and more, resist the inquisitive eyes and hungry notebooks of foreigners who are not true friends. They still regard stray Europeans with hostile suspicion and as fair subjects for loot. 
but Lawrence's minute knowledge of their intricate customs and his apparent complete mastery of the Quran and complex Mohammedan law caused them to regard him with a tolerance and respect which are exceedingly rare among the fanatical peoples of the Near East. And of course his knowledge of their customs and laws was of incalculable importance in enabling him to settle disputes between antagonistic factions. To gain his ends, it was necessary for Lawrence to be a consummate actor. He was obliged completely to submerge his European mode of living, even at the risk of winning the criticism and ridicule of his own countrymen, by appearing in cities like Cairo, where East and West meet, garbed as an Oriental. His critics scoffed and said that he did not or did this merely to gain notoriety, but there was a far deeper reason. Lawrence knew that he was being watched constantly by Sharif's sheiks and tribesmen, and he knew that they would regard it as a very great compliment to them if he went about, even among his own people, dressed in the costume of the desert. During those first days which I had spent with Lawrence in Jerusalem, he wore nothing but Bedouin garb, nor did he ever appear to be aware of the curiosity excited by his costume in the streets of the holy city, for he always gave one the impression that he was engrossed in his own thoughts hundreds of miles or hundreds of centuries away and usually on the occasion when he visited Palestine and Egypt in Arab kit, he was obliged to go direct to Ramla or Cairo from one of his expeditions across the desert. He was therefore obliged to turn up at headquarters just as he happened to be dressed for his work, without wasting the valuable days which would have been required for him to return all the way south to the base camp at Aqaba for a uniform, just to satisfy his critics. When in the desert, he never wore anything but Arab garb, nor could he have succeeded in the amazing way that he did had he offended the Arabs by wearing European costume. When off in the blue on his she dromedary, it was not feasible for Lawrence to take a wardrobe along in his camelbacks. The speed with which he trekked obliged him to travel light. In fact, he usually carried nothing but a lump of unleavened bread, a bit of chocolate, his canteen, chlorine tablets, a toothbrush, a rifle, revolver, and ammunition, and his little volume of the satires of Aristophanes in the original. The rifle which he carried through the whole campaign had a colorful history. Just one of the ordinary British Army variety, the Turks had captured it at the Dardanelles, and Enver Pasha had adorned it with metal plate worked with gold and carrying the inscription to Faisal with Enver's regards. Enver had given it to Amir Faisal early in 1916, before the outbreak of the Sharifian Revolution, in order to prove to Faisal that the Turks had already won the war. Later the Emir gave it to Lawrence, and the latter carried it on all his raids. For every Turk he killed, he cut a notch, a big one for an officer and a little one for a soldier. The rifle is now in the possession of King George. Occasionally, when he went to Cairo or to Jerusalem to make a report to General Allenby, he wore the uniform of a British officer, but even after he had attained the rank of colonel, he preferred the uniform of a second lieutenant, usually without insignia of any kind. I have seen him in the streets of Cairo without a belt, with unpolished boots, negligence next to high treason in the British army. To my knowledge, he was the only British officer in the war who so completely disregarded all the little precisions and military formalities for which Tommy Atkins and his officers are world famous. Lawrence rarely saluted, and when he did, it was simply with a wave of the hand, as though he were saying, Hello, ah, old man, to a pal. He rarely saluted anyone senior to him, although he always made it a point to acknowledge salutes from men in the ranks. As for military titles, he abhorred them, and from general to private, he was known as plain Lawrence. Several times in the desert, he told me how thoroughly he disliked the red tape of the army, and said that as soon as the war was over, he intended to go back to archaeology. He was no parlor conversationalist. Lawrence rarely said anything to anyone unless it was necessary to give instructions, or ask advice, or answer a direct question. Even in the heat of the Arabian campaign, he sought solitude. Frequently, I found him in his tent, reading an archaeological quarterly when the rest of the camp was worked up to fever pitch over a plan of attack. He was so shy that when General Sir Gilbert Clayton, the distinguished commander of the Secret Corps, or some other officer sought to compliment him on one of his exploits, he would get red as a schoolgirl and look down at his feet. Several years ago, in Calcutta, Colonel Robert Lorraine, the eminent actor-airman, said to me, 
But if Lawrence is so extremely modest and shy, why did we pose for so many photographs for you? A keen question, and a natural one. And out of justice to Lawrence, I think I ought to answer it, even at the expense of disclosing a professional secret. My cameraman, Mr. Chase, uses a high-speed camera. We saw considerable of Colonel Lawrence in Arabia, and although he arranged for us to get both still and motion pictures of Amir Faisal, Auda Abu Tayy, and the other Arab leaders, he would turn away when he saw the lens pointing in his direction. We got more pictures of the back of his kufia than of his face, but after much strategy, and after using all the artifice that I had learned as a reporter on a Chicago newspaper, where it was worth one's job to fail to bring back a photograph of the fair lady involved in the latest scandal, I finally maneuvered Lawrence into allowing Chase to take a sitting shot on two different occasions. Then, while I kept Colonel Lawrence's attention away from Mr. Chase by keeping up a rapid fire of questions regarding our projected trip to the lost city of Petra, which he believed to be the primary object of our visit to Arabia, Mr. Chase hurriedly took a dozen pictures from as many different angles, and in less time than it usually requires for a fussy studio photographer to set up and expose two plates. Anyone familiar with the methods of newspaper photographers will appreciate the simplicity of this, where you are working out of doors in good light. If you've got a Graflex and don't get stricken with buck fever at the critical moment, you can get photographs of St. Vitus himself. I realized that Lawrence was one of the most romantic figures of the war. I knew that he had a great scoop, and I had made up my mind that we would not leave Arabia until we had the photographs we wanted. Frequently Chase snapped pictures of the colonel without his knowledge, or just at the instant that he turned and found himself facing the lens and discovered our perfidy. When two experienced hunters start out for game, one to act as decoy, and the other to do the shooting, the poor victim has about as much chance as the Bengal tiger, who has been selected as the target for visiting royalty. But to get back to the topic of how Lauren succeeded in obtaining such a wonderful hold over the Arabs by dressing like them, and mastering the smallest details of the daily life by his courage, his modesty, his physical prowess, and his mature wisdom, there could hardly be any question of the way in which this youth gained the confidence, not only of the more cosmopolitan descendants of the Prophet who ruled over the cities of Holy Arabia, but also of the Bedouin tribes of the desert, who will be regarded by historians of the future as one of the most amazing personal achievements of this age. The phenomenal character of his accomplishment can be more accurately appraised if we keep in mind that for 1,300 years, since the days of Muhammad, Fewer Europeans have explored Holy Arabia than have penetrated mysterious Tibet or Central Africa. The zealous Mohammedans who live around the sacred cities of Mecca and Medina prevent Christians, Jews, and other non-Mohammedans from profaning holy soil, and the unbeliever who ventures into this part of Arabia is indeed lucky if he returns alive. So Lawrence's achievements seem all the more extraordinary when we remember that he admitted openly that he was a Christian. For even though he did wear the robes and the accoutrements of a Sharif of Mecca, he only actually posed as an Oriental when he slipped through the Turkish lines, wearing the veil of a native woman. Of course, the vast wealth which he had at his disposal, the seemingly inexhaustible supply of gold sovereigns with which he paid his army, was of vast importance. But though the Germans and Turks also tried using gold, their weakness lay in the fact that they had no Lawrence, declares H. St. John Philby, the Arabian Authority, who represented Britain in the Central Arabian Desert ruled over by Ibn Saud. Colonel Lawrence played the part of a man of mystery endowed with the ability to do everything superlatively well, outvying the Arabs at everything from statecraft to camel riding, and even to using delicate shadings of their own language. In fact, language seems easy for him. In addition to his mother tongue, he speaks French, Italian, Spanish, and German, some Dutch, Norwegian, and Hindustani, is a master of ancient Latin and Greek, and can manipulate many of the Arabic dialects of the Near East. Lawrence was exceedingly careful never to enter into competition with the Bedouins unless he was quite certain of excelling them. He also gained a reputation as a man of deeds rather than words, which greatly impressed the desert dwellers, who for the most part chatter as incessantly as the crows of India. When he did speak, he had something of importance to say, and knew wherever he spoke. He seldom made errors, and when he did, he took care that the Arabs should ultimately regard it as a success. He was an indefatigable worker, even under conditions of ever-insistent hospitality, and he would work far into the night when his Arab colleagues were asleep. 
It was late at night, or while trekking across the desert, swaying in the camel saddle, that he would plan his far-reaching policies of diplomacy and strategy. Small and wiry, he seemed made of steel, but the desert war left its indelible mark on him in more ways than one, for one of his brothers confided to me that ever since his return from Arabia, he has suffered from severe heart strain. Howda Abu Tahi, always sincere in his judgment of people, once said to me, I have never seen anyone with such a capacity for work, and he is one of the finest camel riders that ever trekked across the desert. A Bedouin can pay no finer compliment. Then added Auda, By the beard of the Prophet, he seems more than a man. Chapter 32 The Art of Handling Arabs Colonel Lawrence believed in the Arabs, and the Arabs believed in him, but they would never have trusted him so implicitly had he not been such a complete master of their customs and all the superficial external features of Arabian life. I once asked him when we were trekking across the desert what he considered the best way of dealing with the wild nomad peoples of this part of the world. My motive was to try to get him to tell in his own words something about the methods that had enabled him to accomplish what no other man could. I am confident that he thought I wanted the information merely for my own immediate use in dealing with the Bedouins with whom we were living. Had he suspected that I was attempting to make him talk about himself, he would have turned the conversation into other channels. The handling of Arabs might be termed an art, not a science, with many exceptions and no obvious rules, was his answer. The Arab forms his judgment on externals that we ignore and so it is vitally important that a stranger should watch every movement he makes and every word he says during the first weeks of association with the tribe. Nowhere in the world is it so difficult to atone for a bad start as with the Bedouins. However, if you once succeed in reaching the inner circle of a tribe and actually gain their confidence, you can do pretty much as you please with them and at the same time do many things yourself that would have caused them to regard you as an outcast had you been too forward at the start. The beginning and end of the secret of handling Arabs is an unremitting study of them. Always keep on your guard, never speak an unnecessary word, watch yourself and your companions constantly, hear all that passes, search out what is going on beneath the surface, read the characters of Arabs, discover their tastes and weaknesses, and keep everything you find out to yourself. Bury yourself in Arab circles, have no ideas and no interests except the work in hand, so that you master your part thoroughly enough to avoid any of the little slips that would counteract the painful work of weeks. Your success will be in proportion to your mental effort. To illustrate the importance the Bedouins place on externals, Lawrence told me that on one occasion a British officer went up country, and the first night as the guest of a Hawatat sheik. He sat down on the guest rug of honor with his feet stretched out in front of him, instead of tucked under him in Arab fashion. That officer was never popular with the Hawatat. To the Bedouin, it is as offensive to display the pedal extremities ostentatiously as it would be for us to put our feet on the table at a dinner party. A short distance behind us in the caravan rode a chief of the Shamar Arabs, who had a great scar across his face. Lawrence related this story. While that fellow was dining with Ibn Rashid, the ruler of North Central Arabia, he happened to choke. He felt so much humiliated that he jerked out his knife and slit his mouth right up to the carotid artery in his cheek, merely to show his host that a bit of meat had actually stuck in his back teeth. The Arabs considered it a sign of very bad breeding for a man to choke over his food. Not only does it show that he's greedy, but it is believed that the devil has caught him. Other fine points of etiquette are bound up in the fact that Bedouins never use forks and knives, but simply reach into the various dishes on the table with their hands. For instance, it is extremely bad form for anyone to eat with his left hand. The diet in the wool nomad of Arabia never makes allowances for any ignorance of desert customs informing his judgment of a stranger. If you have not mastered desert etiquette, you are regarded as an alien and perhaps hostile outsider. Lawrence's understanding of the Arabs and his unfailing ability to do the right thing at the right moment was uncanny. Of course, he could not have lived as an Arab in Arabia if he had not learned the family history of all the prominent peoples of the desert, including the complete list of their friends and enemies. 
He was expected to know that a certain man's father had been hanged, or that his mother was the divorced wife of some famous chieftain. It would be as awkward to inquire about an Arab's father, if he had been a famous fighter, as if it would be as it would be to introduce a divorced woman to her former husband. If Lawrence desired any information, he gained it by indirect means and by cleverly leading the conversation around to the subject in which he was interested. He never asked questions. Fortunately for the Arab nationalist movement and for the Allies, Lawrence had got beyond the stage of making mistakes before the war, and at one time was actually a sheik of a tribe in Mesopotamia. It is vitally important for anyone dealing with the desert peoples to speak their local dialects, not the Arabic current in some other part of the East, declared Lawrence. The safest plan is to be rather formal at first, to avoid getting too deeply involved in conversation. Nearly all the officers sent to cooperate with the Arabs in the revolt spoke the Egyptian Arabic dialect. The Arabs despised the Egyptians, whom they regard as poor relations. Therefore, most of the Europeans sent by the Allies to cooperate with the Hajar people found themselves coldly treated. The Allies succeeded in winning the Arabs to their cause because Lawrence was able to crystallize the Arabian idea of winning independence from the Turks into a definite form and because he had attained the usual distinction of being taken into the bosom of most of the tribes. It was Colonel Lawrence who was mainly responsible for the permanent elevation of Hussein, Faisal, and Abdullah to their respective thrones. Lawrence believed that the best way to consolidate the desert peoples and wipe out their terrible blood feuds would be to create an Arabian aristocracy. Nothing of this kind had ever existed in Arabia before, because the nomads of the Near East are the freest people on earth and refuse to recognize any authority higher than themselves. But all Arabs have for centuries accorded a little extra respect to the direct descendants of the founder of their religion. Lawrence, in his attempt to persuade the Arabs to recognize Sharifs as specially chosen people, cleverly took advantage of the fact that the family tree of Hussein towered higher, in fact, than the eucalyptus, right up to the Prophet himself. But I am sure he would never have been able to accomplish this if he had not received the unlimited financial support of the British government. A stream of several hundred thousand pounds in glittering golden sovereigns was poured into Arabia each month to enable the young archaeologist to pay King Hussein's Arabian army. Lawrence had practically unlimited credit. He could draw any amount he desired up to a million pounds or so. But gold alone would not have sufficed, for the Turks and Germans had tried its lure and failed. The Arabs hated the Turks even more than they loved gold. Since the beginning of time, the sheiks or patriarchs of one tribe have had one have had absolutely no influence with members of other tribes. Sharifs, who really do not belong to any tribe, were recognized as superior leaders only by the people of Mecca, Medina, and the larger towns. The word Sharif, or Shrif, as it is spelled in Arabic, a language without vowels, signified honor. A Sharif is supposed to be a man who displays honor. In the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, Sharif Hussein and Sharif Faisal had long stood high in the esteem of the inhabitants, who were accustomed to refer to them as Sidi, or Lord. The carefree Bedouins, unlike their city cousins, merely addressed them as Hussein and Faisal, without bothering about titles. But Lawrence, with his usual powers of persuasion, convinced even the Bedouins that they should adopt the term Sidi in referring to all Sharifs. So successful was he that within a few months, in spite of the fact that he was a foreigner and a Christian, they honored even Lawrence with this title because of their deep and genuine admiration for him. Lieutenant Colonel C. E. Vickery, CMG, DSO, etc., another able officer of the regular army who played a prominent part in the campaign and afterward acted as British agent at Jeddah, gives us a vivid glimpse into the formality of a Sharif's daily life. Colonel Vickery is one of the few Europeans who have ever visited Taif, the summer capital of the Hijah, a city that is not nearly so sacred as Mecca or Medina, but nevertheless a place about which the outside world knows nothing. It was quite dark when we arrived, very cold and stiff, relates Colonel Vickery. We were asked into the guest chamber, a fine apartment, its floors covered with priceless Persian carpets, and round the walls cushions and pillows. Courteously, our host turned to us, and, embracing us on each cheek, 
prayed Allah to bless us and murmured the graceful compliment that we were now in our own home. For an hour we sat in that room drinking coffee and highly sugared tea and smoking, while we watched an eastern scene that centuries have not changed. The Sharif had only been absent a day, but such is the etiquette of the East that it behooved all to pay their respects to him on his safe return from a journey. To the threshold of the door from time to time came relatives, friends, and slaves. All removed their slippers and entered the room. The door was open, according to their station. The slaves came in quickly bent with due humility and hastily kissed the two fingers extended to them, and as hastily withdrew. Dependents entered more leisurely and kissed the back of the Sharif's hand. Turning it over, they then kissed the part between the first finger and the thumb and withdrew quietly. Friends came in, and for these the Sharif rose, showed a faint reluctance at having his hand kissed, and embraced them on one cheek with murmured salutations. For his relatives he rose, allowed his hand to be kissed with seeming reluctance, and then saluted them warmly on each cheek, straining them to his breast, and murmuring many and heartfelt wishes for their long life and happiness. The special deference paid to Sharifs by the townsmen and villagers in particular had long ago developed in the city Arabs a sense of their own superior responsibility and honor. That, of course, was of great assistance to Lawrence in greeting his Arabian aristocracy. In fact, it was by the sagacious use of this personal responsibility that Lawrence and his associates were able to unify the rival tribes and develop men capable of acting as subordinate leaders under King Hussein, Prince Faisal, and his brothers. In order to carry out his plans for widening the influence of the Sharifs and making Hussein the recognized ruler of the Shah, Lawrence had first to win the confidence of all the rival tribes. Then, quietly, in such a manner as to make them think the idea entirely their own, he induced them to forget past tribal differences and unite under the leadership of Hussein and his sons and the other Sharifs in order to drive out the hated Turk in the hope of helping bring the war to a victorious conclusion for the Allies and in the hope of restoring the Caliphate and the former splendor of their ancient empire. King Hussein had to rely entirely on tribal loyalty for his military strength. His personal Bedouin following was drawn principally from two of the most numerous tribes of the desert, the Harb and the Ataba, together with one tribe of inferior rank, the Juhaina. These three tribes occupy a great block of territory embracing three quarters of the Hijah in the strip of western Nijid. South and west of this block, but within the limits of the Hijah, dwell half a dozen small tribes the Hudhel, Beni, Sa'ad, Bukum, Muter, Thakif, and Juhatla. Still further south is a group of powerful tribes, the Dar, Hassan, Gamid, Zaran, and Sharan, whose adhesion meant the favorable disposal of stouter fighting material than the Hijah itself could supply. All of them sent contingents to assist King Hussein. From the country north of the central group, he drew reinforcements from three of the smaller Anaze tribes, the Bili, immediately north of Juhaina, enrolled to a man, and they were followed by the Atiya and Hawatat, the great Hawatat tribe which roams the country between the head of the Gulf of Aqaba and the lower end of the Dead Sea in Central Arabia, has more enemies, causes more trouble, and takes part in more blood feuds than any other group of tent dwellers. One can meet no more obstinate, unruly, and quarrelsome people. They seem to have no fear. The Hawatats find it impossible to unite even among themselves when attacked from without. About the only thing they possess in common are wounds and the same tribal marks on their camels. This great tribe has two subdivisions, the Ibn Jazi and the Abu Tai, of which old Auda Abu Tai, the Bedouin Robin Hood, is the chieftain. But Auda is chieftain only by virtue of his daring and prowess. For no man in that spirited group cares to sh bow down before the authority of any sheik. For fifteen years the two sections of the Hawadot waged relentless war upon each other, until the mild-voiced Sharif Lawrence succeeded in getting them both to unite with Hussein and Faisal to drive out the Turks. But even then Lawrence found it advisable to keep the two sections attached to different parts of his army, so that they could not leap at each other's throats. Both were willing to obey Lawrence's orders so long as they were kept apart, but in the event of their meeting they regarded themselves in 
honor bound to start a row. Aru Abutai and his people consider the Druzes, who waged the most merciless war in the desert, among their most bitter blood enemies, and Lawrence more than had his hands full to prevent them from killing each other instead of the Turks. In 1912, fifty of Aru's fighting men mounted on camels captured the Druze cavalrymen in battle. This is striking evidence of the fighting ability of the Hawatat warriors, because one horseman is usually worth two camelmen in a fight because of the fact a horse can be maneuvered so much more rapidly. Since that engagement, the Druzes have been continually on the alert, hoping to take the Hawatat by surprise and annihilate them. In spite of these minor insurgencies, the Hawatat under Auda's leadership became the finest fighting force in Western Arabia, regarded by Colonel Lawrence as the backbone of his wild desert army. Perhaps train wrecking was Lawrence's most spectacular pastime, but nothing he did was more significant or remarkable than this consolidation of the Arab tribes. With them, raiding hostile neighbors was both their amusement and their business. To invite two enemy chieftains into Amir Faisal's tent to swear friendship and loyalty over the ghosts of stolen horses and camels was like asking a Wall Street magnate to turn over his fortune to communists. In order to illustrate the delicacy of the problem that Lawrence manipulated, let me cite a particular instance. In June 1917, we were attending a conference in the courtyard of Amir Faisal's palace at Akaba, a one-story structure resembling with its extensive interior courtyard a Spanish hacienda. The palace is situated in the little town back of a fringe of waving palm trees, the only green splash of color in this stretch of sand, where once was located the great seaport of King Solomon. In a circle around the emir were seated thirty sharifs and sheiks, all heads of prominent tribes, and among them six sheiks of the Ibn Jazi Hawatat. All of a sudden I saw a swift change come over the unusually impassive countenance of the young Englishman. Jumping to his feet, Lawrence slipped noiselessly to the doorway of the courtyard. I saw him speak to a group of Arabs who were about to enter, and then lead them off in another direction. Later, when I asked him the reason for his speedy exit, he informed me that the warriors at the entrance were none other than the renowned Auda, his cousin Mohammed, and some of the other leading fighting men of the Abu Tayy. He added that if Auda and his companions had come on through into the palace courtyard, a bloody battle might have been fought right in front of Amir Faisal, possibly resulting in the total disruption of the Arabian forces. Until he became an undisputed leader, Lawrence kept in constant touch with the king of the Jah, and his four sons, principally Amir Faisal. He lived with the leaders that he might be with them when they were dining or holding audiences in their tents. It was his theory that giving direct and formal advice was not nearly so effective as the constant dropping of ideas in casual talk. At his meals, the Arab was off guard and at his ease, engaging in small talk and general conversation. Whenever Lawrence wanted to make a new move, start a raid, or capture a town, he would bring up the question casually and indirectly, and before half an hour had passed, he usually succeeded in inspiring one of the prominent sheiks to suggest the plan. Lawrence would then seize his advantage, and before the sheik's enthusiasm had time to wane, he would push him on to the execution of the plan. On one occasion, Lawrence was dining with Amir Faisal and some of his leaders, not far from Aqaba. The Arab chieftains thought it would be a splendid plan to take Dara, the important railway junction hundreds of miles farther north, just south of Damascus. Lawrence knew that Dara could be captured, but he also realized that at that stage of the campaign it could not be held for any length of time, so he said, Oh yes, that's a fine idea, but first let's work out the details. A great council of war was held, but somehow the longer the matter was discussed, the less enthusiasm manifested itself. In fact, the Arab leaders became so disheartened that they even suggested retreating from the position that they occupied at that moment. Then Lawrence delicately suggested that such a retreat would greatly anger King Hussein, and little by little he prevailed upon them to go through the original plan for capturing Aqaba, which was his first objective. As Lawrence once remarked to me under his breath when we were attending a consultation of Arab leaders, everybody is a general in the Arab army. In British circles, a general is allowed to make a mess of things by himself. 
whereas here in Arabia every man wants a hand in making the mess complete. The Arab Sharifs and Sheikhs are strong-minded and obstinate men. Nothing hurts them more than to have someone point out the mistakes. If you say rubbish to an Arab, it is sure to put his back up, and he will ever afterward decline to help you. Lawrence never refused to consider any scheme that was put forward, even though he had the actual power to do so. Instead, he always approved a plan and then skillfully directed the conversation so that the Arab himself modified it to suit Lawrence, who would then announce it publicly to the other Arab leaders before the originator of the scheme had time to change his point of view. All this would be manipulated in such a delicate way that the Arab would not for a moment be aware that he was acting under pressure. If Lawrence and his British associates had acted behind the Sharif's back, they might have attained certain of their objectives in half the time, but until Lawrence actually had been raised to supreme command by the voluntary act of the Arabs themselves, and was regarded by them as a sort of superman, he was wise enough never to give direct orders. Even his suggestions and advice to Amir Faisal he reserved until they were alone. From the beginning of the campaign, Lawrence adopted the policy of trying not to do too much himself, always remembering that it was the Arabs' war. At times, when it seemed necessary, he would even strengthen the prestige of the Arab leaders with their subordinates at the expense of his own position. The failure of the Turks and Germans, on the other hand, was partly due to the fact that they rushed at the Arabs blindly and attempted to deal with them in a brutally direct manner. Whenever a new Sharif or Sheikh came for the first time to offer his services to King Hussein, Lawrence and any other British officer present made it a point to leave the emir's tent until the formality of swearing allegiance on the Koran and touching Faisal's hand was over. They did this because the strange sheik might easily become suspicious if his first impression revealed foreigners in Faisal's confidence. At the same time, it was Lawrence's policy always to have his name associated with those of the Sharifs. Everywhere he went, he was regarded as Faisal's mouthpiece. Wave a Sharif in front of you like a hammer. Hide your own mind and person was the maxim of this student Bedouin tactics. But Lawrence was careful not to identify himself too long or too often with any one tribal sheik, for he did not want to lose prestige by being associated with any particular tribe and its inevitable feuds. The Bedouins are extremely jealous. When going on an expedition, Lawrence would ride with everyone up and down the line so that no one could criticize, criticize him for showing favoritism. In every way, Lawrence used his knowledge of desert psychology to the best possible advantage. For instance, he was constantly in need of detailed information regarding the topography of the country over which the Arabian forces were campaigning. But the Bedouins are always reluctant to reveal the location of wells, springs, and points of vantage. Lawrence convinced them that making maps was an accomplishment of every educated man. Abdul Abu Tayy and many of the other sheikhs became so keenly interested in maps that they often kept Lawrence up to all hours of the night, helping them with maps that were not of the slightest military value, and in which he was not in the least interested. Chapter 33 Lawrence the Man Although he had been cited for nearly every decoration that the British and French governments had to offer, Lawrence sedulously ran away from them by camel, aeroplane, or any available method of swift transportation. The French government sent word to its contingent in Arabia to bestow upon the dashing colonel the Croix de Guerre with palms. Captain Bassani, commandant of the French force at Aqaba, was anxious to make the ceremony an impressive affair. He wanted to have all the British, French, and Arab troops out on parade so that he could deliver an appropriate eulogistic address, present the decoration to Lawrence, and then kiss him on both cheeks. But Lawrence heard of the plan and vanished into the desert. Several times he gave the persistent Pisani the slip. In despair, the commandant went to Major Marshal, Lawrence's tent mate, who advised him to surround the mess tent some morning when Lawrence happened to be in Aqaba and take him by surprise. So Pisani and his detachment waited until he returned, then turned up in full regalia, surrounded him just as he had reached the marmalade course, and read an impressive document relating how he had gone for days without food or water, and how he had outwitted and defeated the Turks. At the end of the campaign, when Lawrence returned to Europe and left Marshall behind in Arabia, 
The colonel wrote asking his tent mate to ship his things from Aqaba to Cairo. Lawrence neither drank nor smoked, but was inordinately fond of chocolate, and there were dozens of empty tins piled in the corner of his tent, together with books, bits of theodolites, a camel saddle, cartridge drums, and odds and ends from machine guns. In one of the empty chocolate tins, the Major found the French decoration which Bassani had presented. He put it in his own bag, and when Lawrence came to meet Emir Faisal and the Arab delegates at Marseille, Major Marshall pulled his leg by making another speech reminding the Colonel of his splendid works for France, and then re-presented him with the Croix de Guerre with palms. When the Duke of Connaught visited Palestine to confer the Grand Cross of the Order of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem on General Allenby, he intended to present a decoration to Lawrence as well. The young leader of the Arabian forces happened at the time to be out in the blue, busily blowing up Turkish trains. Aeroplanes were sent to scour the desert for him. Messages were dropped on various Arab camps requesting anyone who saw Sharif Lawrence to tell him to report to Jerusalem. One fine day, Lawrence came strolling in on foot through the Turkish lines to show his indifference of the enemy. In the meantime, the ceremony in Jerusalem had already taken place, and the Duke of Connaught had gone to Egypt. Knowing Lawrence's peculiar aversion to the acceptance of medals or military honors of any kind, his associates of the intelligence staff succeeded in seducing him to Cairo, only by inventing some other plausible pretext. Upon his arrival, a subaltern who was not acquainted with Lawrence's eccentricities inadvertently tipped him off to the fine affair that was to be staged for his benefit. Without stopping to pick up his uniform and kit at Shepherd's Hotel, Lawrence hurried out to the headquarters of the Flying Gord Heliopolis, an oasis a few miles from Cairo, jumped into an aeroplane, and taxied back to Arabia. Not only did he care nothing for decorations, but he avoided wearing what ribbons he possessed. Captain Ferdinand Twoey, in his exploits of the Secret Corps, says of him, Colonel Lawrence was given the companionship of the bath for his services. He was actually recommended for the Victoria Cross, but was not granted that supreme decoration because there had never been a senior officer witness of his exploits. A lame enough excuse, seeing that there was ample proof in a dozen ways that those exploits had well and truly been carried out. As a matter of fact, although Lawrence was posted for the CB, he never attended any ceremony in connection with receiving it, and he asked his friends to sidetrack the recommendation for the Victoria Cross. He also stood aside when he had an opportunity to become a general at the time when his force was actually the right wing of Allenby's army, and when he was practically filling the role of a lieutenant general. He even declined knighthood. When I asked him why he didn't want to be knighted, he replied, Well, if I become a knight, my tailor will hear about it and double my bills. I have trouble enough paying them as it is. So far as I know, there was only one thing that Lawrence wanted out of the war, and that was something that he didn't get. I asked him once if there was anything to be bought with money that he couldn't afford but would like to have. His answer, which he gave unhesitatingly, showed how human and simple he is. He replied, I should like to have a Rolls Royce car, with enough tires and petrol to last me all my life. The particular car that he would have liked to have had was the Rolls Royce tender called the Blue Mist, which he used during some of his railway demolition raids around Damascus. But after the war, it was overhauled and became Allenby's personal car at the residency in Cairo. Lawrence had often been criticized for refusing the various honors offered him, but the truth of the matter is that he did not decline them merely to be eccentric. For instance, before the war, he was presented with the Order of the Magi Magidia by the Sultan of Turkey for having saved the lives of some of the Germans at work of the Berlin to Baghdad Railway when the natives were going to mob them. Then, shortly before the outbreak of the Arabian Revolution, still a subordinate in Cairo, he received and accepted a number of decorations, including the Legion of Honor. But he refused the rewards offered to him for what he had accomplished in Arabia, because he had realized from the very beginning that the Allies, once victory was secured, would find it difficult not only to satisfy the claims of the Arabs, but even to fulfill their obligations to the Hijar leaders. He realized full well that the French were determined to have Syria, and he knew all along that they would never agree to the Arabs even keeping Damascus. 
Lawrence therefore felt that he did not care to accept anything in return for having conducted a campaign based on promises which the Allies could not fulfill to the extent to which he believed they ought to be fulfilled. Perhaps he would have felt differently had he known that his friend Emir Faisal would be crowned king in Baghdad after losing the Syrian throne, which Lawrence foresaw he would never be allowed to occupy for long. But at the end of the war, no one dreamed that Faisal was going to be the founder of a new dynasty in the city of Harun al-Rashid, after first being driven out of Damascus by the French. The only honor that Lawrence accepted was one perhaps more dear to his heart than any other, a fellowship at All Souls College, Oxford. This fellowship is awarded a man of exceptional scholastic attainments. There are only a score or so of them. Usually men past the prime of life who are completing important historical, literary, or scientific works. For example, Lord Curzon is a fellow at All Souls. The distinction is an unusual one. It carries with it a modest honorarium and attractive quarters of the college, a delightful place for a distinguished scholar to retire. There is no prescribed work that goes with it, and Lawrence once told me that there were but three requirements for a fellowship at All Souls to be a good dresser, to be adept at small conversation, and to be a good judge of port. And then he added, my clothes are an abomination. As a parlor conversationalist, I'm hopeless, and I never drink. So how I came to receive this honor is a mystery to me. After his election to all souls, Lawrence divided his time between the college, the home of a friend in Westminster known as the House with the Green Door, and a bungalow that he built for himself in Epping Forest. The porter at All Souls said that they never knew when to expect him, that when he was in residence he rarely dined with the other fellows, and the light in his studio usually burned all night. No doubt he was busy on his Arabian book, but he did the most of his writing at the house with the green door, where he occupied a bare room that had been an architect's office. One of his friends had given him a fur-lined aviator's costume, and in the dead of winter, when the cold in London is decidedly penetrating, he would sit in that bleak room in his fur-lined suit, writing the inside story of his experiences in far-off Araby. On his frequent trips to Oxford, he would carry his manuscript in a little black bag like those used by London bank messengers. On one such occasion, after he had gone through the gate to the platform of Paddington Station, he put the bag down for a moment and walked over to the newsstand for a paper. When he returned, the bag was gone. It not only contained the only copy of his 200,000-word manuscript, which he had written entirely in longhand, but it also contained the journal that he had kept faithful through the desert campaign and many valuable original historical documents that can never be replaced. I saw him a few days later, and in telling me about the theft of the bag, he referred to it jokingly and merely said, I've been saved a lot of trouble, and after all it's a good thing the bag was stolen, the world had simply spared another war book. The bag and its contents were never seen or heard of again. Lawrence's theory was that they were probably thrown into the Thames by the disappointed thief who had hoped for a better haul. But his friends finally prevailed upon him to rewrite the book, and this time in order to find solitude away from the curious admirers who were constantly disturbing him at all souls and a solitude that carried with it a means of keeping body and soul together, he enlisted in the Royal Air Force under the name of Private Ross. Even there he was unable to conceal his identity, and someone, for a consideration, tipped off a London newspaper with the result that once more he found himself drawn into the limelight. A few weeks previous he had agreed to sell the publication rights for a large sum, but when this unexpected publicity appeared he turned down the contract left the Air Force, called on the various London editors imploring them to allow him to live in peace and print nothing more about him, and then vanished again. One of Colonel Lawrence's hobbies is printing books by hand. There are few things that he likes more than an attractive book, and he has a valuable library of rare hand-printed volumes. On the edge of Epping Forest, some ten miles out from London, he built himself a little cottage with an interior resembling a chapel. Here he installed a hand press, and when he finally finished his Arabian book, he made six copies. A few were presented to friends, and 
One copy went to the British Museum Library to lock, be locked up in a vault for 40 years. That is, unless someone can prevail upon him to release it for publication. Rudyard Kipling, George Bernard Shaw, and several of Lawrence's literary friends were among those to read it, and one of the most famous writers of the day declared that he considered it a pyramid in English literature. Lawrence has great literary ability and a style of his own. He is as individualistic in his writing as in everything else that he does. A number of brilliant articles have come from his pen since he put aside the curved gold sword of a Sharif of Mecca, and he has written an introduction um, to a new edition of Arabia Deserta, which all agree forms a valuable addition to that classic. Nor could he receive higher literary praise than that, for all Orientalists can see that the foremost work ever published on Arabia is Charles Montague Doughty's Travels in Arabia Deserta. Lawrence says of it, there is no sentiment, nothing really picturesque, that most common failing of Oriental travel books. Doughty's completeness is devastating. It is a book which begins powerfully, written in a style which is apparently neither father nor son, so closely wrought, so tense, so just in its words and phrases, that it demands a hard reader. But Doughty's book had been out of print for many years, and copies of it were extremely rare. We call the book Doughty, pure and simple, adds Lawrence, for it is a classic, and the personality of Mr. Doughty hardly comes into question. Indeed, it is rather shocking to learn that he's a real and living person. The book has no date and can never grow old. It is the first and indispensable work upon the Arabs of the desert, and if it has not always been referred to, or enough read, that has been because it was excessively rare. So he set about to rectify this deficiency. He proposed that a new two-volume edition be published to sell for forty-five dollars, half what dealers had been asking for second-hand copies of the original. Doughty, an old man, had for years been devoting himself to poetry and existing on a poet's pittance. So Lawrence had at least three reasons for seeing a new edition published to get the public better acquainted with the classic, to augment the income of his illustrious friend and predecessor, and to pay personal tribute to one to whom he felt deeply indebted. In the preface, Doughty says regarding Lawrence and the new edition, a reprint has been called for, and is reproduced thus at the suggestion chiefly of my distinguished friend, Colonel T. E. Lawrence, leader with Faisal, Mech, and Prince, of the nomad tribesmen, whom they, as might none other at that time marching from Jidda, the port of Mecca, were able, composing as they went the tribe's long-standing blood feuds and old enmities, to unite with them in victorious arms against the corrupt Turkish sovereignty in those parts, and to greatly thus serving his country's cause and our allies from the eastward amidst the great war, as, in that imperishable enterprise, traversed the same wide region of desert Arabia. No sooner was the edition off the press than it was exhausted, and since then more editions have followed. So Lauren's ambition to do something for Doughty and gain for his classic a still wider circulation was more than realized. Unquestionably, the sale of Arabia Deserta was stimulated by the fact that Lawrence had written a special introduction to it, in which he paid glowing tribute to the great traveler whose experiences in the desert had done so much to pave the way for his own success. Lawrence's introduction of this new edition also gives us a hint to his own skill with a pen, and as to what we may expect from his own volume on Arabia. He writes, The realism of the book is complete. Doughty tries to tell the full and exact truth of all that he saw. If there is a bias, it will be against the Arabs, for he liked them so much. He was so impressed by the strange attraction, isolation, and independence of these people that he took pleasure in bringing out their virtues by a careful expression of their faults. If one lives any time with the Arab, he will have all his life after a feeling of the desert. He had experienced in himself the test of nomadism, that most deeply biting of all social disciplines, and for our sakes he strained all the more to paint it in its true colors, as a life too hard, too empty, too denying for all but the strongest and most determined men. Nothing is more powerful than real than this record of all his daily accidents and obstacles, and the feelings that came to him on the way. 
his picture of the Semites sitting to the eyes in a cloaca, uh, but with their brows touching heaven, sums up in full measure their strength and weakness, and the strange contradictions of their thought which quickened curiosity at our first meeting with them. To try and solve their riddle, many of us have gone far into their society and seen the clear hardness of their belief, a limitation almost mathematical, which repels us by its unsympathetic form. Semites have no half-tones in the register of vision. They are people of primary colors, especially of black and white, who see the world always in line. They are certain people despising doubt, our modern crown of thorns. They do not understand our metaphysical difficulties, our self-questionings. They know only truth and untruth, belief and unbelief, without our hesitating retinue of finer shades. Semites are black and white not only in vision, but in their inner furnishing. Black and white not merely in clarity, but in apposition. Their thoughts live easiest among extremes. They inhabit superlatives by choice. Sometimes the great inconsistent seem to possess them jointly. They exclude compromise and pursue the logic of their ideas to its absurd ends, without seeing incongruity in their opposed conclusions. They oscillate with cool head and tranquil judgment from asymptote to asymptote, so imperturbably that they would seem hardly conscious of their giddy flight. Lawrence's command of English is amazing, by reason, of course, of his familiarity with the classics and his knowledge of both ancient and modern languages. His vocabulary is wider than that of most learned professors, and he has great descriptive powers, as we have observed from his description of the death of his friend Talal al Haradin at Safa. While in London and at All Souls, he lived much as he did in the desert. Indeed, from force of habit after his long experience in the East, he has become much like the Bedouins, and has no desire for luxuries. He rarely eats or sleeps regularly, and says it is fatal if you are caught in an emergency to have formed regular habits. He usually goes without sleep one night a week, and eats like a bird. It is his custom to sleep from three to ten in the morning, and then take a long walk until three in the afternoon. Upon his return from his walk, he would work until two in the morning, when he would go out for his dinner. The only places in London open at that unusual hour were the station restaurants, where he would tell the waiter to bring him anything he liked. He hates to order food, and a few minutes after he has had a meal, he has forgotten what the dishes were. When walking along the streets in London, he is usually absorbed and pays no attention to anything until he comes to a start and finds that a bus is about to run him down. In avoiding the network of modern complexities, he seldom has to worry about the countless things that crowd the joy out of our ultra-civilized modern life. He has no private income and scorns money except what he needs for the simple necessities of life and for his one luxury, books. His mother once told me that he had always been a trial to her because she never knew what he was going to do next. He himself declares that he probably will never marry because no woman would live with me. Yet, despite his scorn of money and private life and his well-nigh complete lack of it, while in the desert he had almost unlimited credit and could draw on his government up to many hundreds of thousands of pounds, it was by no means an uncommon sight to see him stuffing ten thousand pounds and gold sovereigns in one camel bag and ten thousand in another. Then off he would go with it, accompanied only by ten or twelve Bedouins. On one occasion, Lawrence drew paltry six hundred pounds for Major Scott to do a bit of shopping. Major Scott kept the boxes of sovereigns in his tent at headquarters in the Akaba. Major Maynard, who was in charge of some of the records, heard of this and asked for a receipt. When Scott informed Lawrence, the latter nearly doubled up with laughter and said, He shall have it. And so far as I could find out, that was the only receipt he ever signed. As for the letters he received in the desert, he usually read them and then burned them and never bothered about answering. His has indeed been a strange existence, full of individual experience. Fond of oriental rugs, Lawrence picked up many rare ones during his wanderings. On the floor of his tent at Akiba were two beauties. Lawrence slept on one of them, while his companion, Major Marshall, used a camp bed. One of the two rugs is now in the possession of Lady Allenby, while Marshall has the other. 
One day in the bazaar in Jeddah, Lawrence saw a barber kneeling on a prayer rug that he liked. It had two holes in it, three or four inches in diameter. The barber offered it to him for two pounds, and Lawrence bought it. When he took it to Cairo and had it appraised by one of the leading rug merchants of Egypt, he found that it was worth about seventy pounds after being repaired. So Lawrence sent the barber a five-pound note. At his mother's home in Oxford, he had a pile of oriental rugs and carpets still covered with the dust of the East. A friend of the family got married at a time when Lawrence was away, and his mother sent one of the rugs as a wedding gift. When the colonel returned, she told him about the incident and said she presumed it was not worth much. That one you gave away cost me a hundred and forty-seven pounds, six hundred and sixty-five dollars, replied Lawrence. But he was not the least bit vexed and promptly forgot all about it. When the year was up, during which he had promised to serve as Near Eastern Advisor at the Colonial Office, Lawrence put on his hat and walked out. Since then he has found a new exhaust for his surplus energy. He met an army officer who had a high-power motorcycle which was too much for the latter to handle. So Lawrence bought it and streaks it about England much as he formerly raced across the North Arabian Desert in the blue mist. When an undergraduate at Oxford, he and another student made a solemn compact that if either ever did anything particularly noteworthy, he would wire for the other to come so that they could celebrate. In 1920, Lawrence telegraphed his friend as follows, Come at once, have done something. This was the first word that had passed between the two since their pre-war college days. When the friend arrived, this is what Lawrence had done that he thought worth celebrating. He had just finished his bungalow on the edge of Epping Forest, and was keeping cows. Epping Forest is a semi-national preserve of some sort, and there is a law that forbids the erection of non-movable structures. After Lawrence had finished his bungalow, the police came and pointed out to him that he had broken the law, because his house was a stationary edifice. So Lawrence bought some paint and made four camouflage red wheels on the side of the cottage. This so amused the authorities that they said no more about the law. But not long afterward a fire wiped out nearly everything he had. As to what will happen to Lawrence in the future, only Allah knows. One thing is certain, that he will not permit his country to make a hero out of him. The maker of history has once more become the student of history. But Lawrence may live to see the effect of the wave that he rolled up out of the desert in the form of an important new power in the East. As a result of the Arabian War of Liberation, which was not a foolish dream on paper, and as a result of Allenby's smashing campaign in Palestine and Syria, three new Arabian states have come into existence. The Kingdom of Hijah under Hussein I of Mecca, the independent state of Transjordania under Hussein's second son, the Sultan Abdullah, and the Kingdom of Iraq in Mesopotamia, where Hussein's third son, King Faisal I, occupies the throne. It is the dream of these three, assisted by Hussein's eldest son, the Emir Ali, who remains in Mecca, one day to form a United States of Arabia. Much depends on King Faisal. Colonel Lawrence played the dominant part in making him the greatest Arab in five centuries. But the task before Faisal is stupendous. He has vision and high ideals for his people. Will he be strong enough to maintain his position in Baghdad and, main, and remain the leading figure in the Arabian world? Events are now moving swiftly in the Near East. If King Faisal can, through the quiet force of his personality, continue the work of wiping out the ancient quarrel between the tribes and cities of the desert in which task he and his father and brothers were given such effective help by Lawrence, and if the nations of the West will send railway, sanitary, and irrigation engineers, and disinterested military and political advisors, cooperate in the establishment of schools and lend financial support, the glory that once was Babylon's may come again in Mesopotamia. The future of King Faisal and his brothers may be the future of Arabia. None may know the end of the story. But one thing is certain, and that is that Faisal, like his romantic predecessor Harun al-Rashid of the Arabian Nights, is a just and merciful monarch. But had it not been for the youthful Lawrence, Faisal would not be ruling in Baghdad today. Nor would his brother Abdullah be the Sultan of Transjordania, 
nor would the Arabs recently have had the opportunity to proclaim King Hussein as the Caliph of al-Islam and Commander of the Faithful. For it was this young man who destroyed the thousand-year-old network of blood feuds, who built up the Arabian army, who planned the strategy of the desert campaign and led the Arabs into battle, who swept the Turks from a thousand miles of country between Mecca and Damascus, who was the brains of the epic Arabian campaign and rode in triumph through the bazaars of Damascus and established a government for Prince Faisal in the capital of Omar and uh, Saladin, the oldest surviving citadel in the world. But without a complete understanding of the mentality and instinct of Arabia, and without a sincere love for the peoples of the desert, this would never have been possible. Nor is it surprising that with such love and understanding from such a man, translated into successful policies and glorious deeds, he won the adoration of the Arab race. Little did young Lawrence dream when he was studying Hittite ruins that it was his destiny to play a major role in building a new empire. Instead of piecing, or piecing together for a scholar's thesis the fragments of a dead and buried kingdom, Captain Twoey has tersely said in his brief note in the Secret Corps, for romantic adventure his career has probably been unexampled in this or in any other war. This 28-year-old poet and scholar had started across the Arabian desert in February 1916 to raise an army, accompanied by only three companions. I do not know of a more helpless task than this that had been essayed during the last thousand years. They at first had no money, no means of transportation except a few camels, and no means of communication except camel riders. They were trying to raise and equip an army in a country which has no manufacturing interests, which produce very little food and less water. In many parts of Arabia, water holes are a five-day camel trek apart. They had no laws to help them, and they were trying to raise an army among the nomadic Bedouin tribes that had been separated from one another by blood feuds for hundreds of years. They were trying to unify people who quarrel over the possession of the water holes and pasture lands of Arabia and war with one another for the possession of camels, a people who, when they meet one another in the desert, usually substitute volleys of pot shots for the conventional rules of oriental courtesy. In habit, instinct, and mental outlook, Europe is utterly at variance with Asia, and it is rarely, only once in hundreds of years, that there comes forward some brilliant Anglo-Saxon, Celt, or Latin who, possessing an understanding that transcends race, religion, and tradition, can adopt the Eastern temperament at will. Such men were Marco Polo, the Venetian, and General Charles Gordon. Such a man is Thomas Edward Lawrence, the modern Arabian Knight. The End of With Lawrence in Arabia by Lowell Thomas